Hi, everyone. I am Sarah Piampiano. I'm a real estate agent with 8Z Real Estate. And with me today is Brady Mullen from American Liberty Mortgage. Um, I took a continuing education course um, maybe a week or two ago, and um, it was all about renting versus owning. And Brady led the course. Um, he was a financial advisor, I think, for over 18 years. And um, one of the things that frustrated him in his field of um, being a financial advisor was just, you know, he found being a homeowner and investing in real estate to be a really powerful wealth building tool. And as an advisor, he wasn't really able um, to advise his clients in that aspect. And so he ended up um, selling his practice and now works for American Liberty um, as a um, doing business development and working with the loan officers and with real estate agents like me to sort of help, um, you know, share the love and the wisdom around, you know, the power of owning a home. So I'm really excited to have him here. And today we're going to talk about the benefits of um, owning over renting. Thanks, sir. It's good to be here. It's good to yeah. chat with you again. Um, yeah. And I want to be clear, like financial advisors, they do good work. They do things that that I think are valuable. They have good tax strategies that they can guide people through. But when it came, when it came down to helping clients advise on very specific real estate decisions, my hands were tied. The compliance attorneys didn't want me talking about this six and sometimes seven figure transaction that clients were about to, to make. And me getting involved in the weeds in that made the attorneys really anxious because they don't have a, they don't have a compliance structure around that sort of thing. So I, I fought with that for a long time and I finally threw up my hands and sold my practice. And now I work in real estate to help people help people see the impact that their real estate choices have on their overall finances. Cause not a lot of people are talking about that. Yeah. When, when I took the class, you, um, you made a statement that was, uh, that resonated with me, which was that I want to help people do things that are truly good for them. And um, I think you know, that is why we're here today, actually, is just to, you know, to share knowledge and to help people um, understand some of the benefits around um, owning real estate and and why it truly, truly is a really good decision um, to, you know, own a home, whether it is as a primary home or a secondary home or, you know, as a investment property. Um, and so, yeah, that's why we're here. Yeah. And I realized as a financial advisor, I was helping people who had money get more or save more. And I, I don't think that's unethical. I don't think that's a bad thing. As long as you're doing that ethically, like smart investing, careful tax planning, things like that, that's a that's a viable industry. And I think it's great. But where, where real estate differs from that in most cases is that making smart decisions about real estate, I think of it this way, like as soon as you move out of mom and dad's house, you have to make a real estate decision if you want a roof over your head right? You either have to rent or own a home. And most of us rent as soon as we leave mom and dad's house, but there's a there's a priority. If we understand how the numbers work, there's a priority to start owning that roof over your head and the dirt beneath your feet because it has massive financial impact. But nobody's talking about that in schools. Financial advisors aren't talking about that. The banks aren't talking about that. And there isn't really a formalized way of people talking about it. So I wanted to fix that. I wanted to bridge that gap between what financial people talk about, which is not unimportant. It's just different. And what real estate people talk about, they do talk about the importance of home ownership. They do talk about um, the value of investing in real estate, but they don't have the tools that the financial community has. And I know your background is in finance also. They have great tools and great modeling tools and great ways to run uh, projections on decisions so that you can know the, the likely outcome of a decision, a big decision before you actually make it. That's what the projections are for. And financial people have those tools, but they can't talk about real estate very, uh, very granularly. And real estate people generally don't have those tools, or if they do, they're they're sitting at home on somebody's Excel spreadsheet or something like that, which is fine. There are good there are good and smart people in real estate that that know finance, but it's not an industry or it's not a it's not a focus of the industry itself to make this more publicly well known. And I think that it should be because our real estate choices, even the very first one, renting versus owning, and then there's upsizing and downsizing and relocating and refinancing and all, all the decisions that people make throughout their lives that are related to real estate. And they have massive, massive consequences on our finances. And yet the financial aspect, the financial group isn't talking about it. And the real estate people, they may or may not talk about it, right? It's just not a part of what's normally uh, given to real estate agents and lenders as tools to help integrate that into personal finance. So that's that's my passion. That's why I'm here. 
And I think I I think that's a really good segue actually into um you know what we want to talk about today. You know, I think um uh, we're in the middle of October and interest rates are hovering around 8%. Mm. And um there's a lot of people that are sitting on the sidelines saying I'm going to wait for interest rates to come down. I'm going to wait for interest rates to come down. And and they're also, you know, some people are even taking a little bit of a deeper dive and saying, okay, let me let me look into buying. And then they start, they get connected to a lender and, you know, they get pre-qualified and they find out what it's going to cost for them to buy a $500,000 home, um, which, you know, in today's market is really an en- pretty close to an entry-level home. And they're seeing that their monthly payments are going to be you know, give or take around four thousand um, dollars. Let's talk about and that and that scares people off. So sure. let's talk about you know why that might be a good decision today, in light of the fact that interest rates are where they are. So I like to think of it. I mean, this is just me personally. I'm sure you'll have things to say about it as well. But I don't like to think of it in terms of timing because I think that's misleading. It gets us to think about things in the wrong way. So if somebody were to ask me, hey, do you think now is a good time to buy real estate? A lot of people in our industry, I mean, anybody watching this can probably guess, oh, I know what they're going to say. If, if we ask them, is it a good time to buy real estate? Real estate people are going to say, yeah, it's a great time to buy real estate. And then they'll come up with some reason to justify that. And I, I just don't, they may or may not be right, but I don't ever pretend that I know the future. I just don't. Like people keep talking about, oh, well, rates will come down later and you can refinance. We don't know that, right? We don't know that. I, I hope that they do, but we don't know that. So here's how I here's how I address that question. Like, is it a good time to buy real estate? I think, well, I don't know. There's there's reasons why it's good and things could go favorably, reasons why they, it might not go as favorably as it might otherwise, but it's always better than renting. So the, the, just flop the, the question in reverse and ask, is it a good time to rent the roof over your head? Is it a good time to rent the home where you raise your family or, or where you spend you know, a bunch of your time That is almost never true. In fact, I can't think of a time in history when that was true, other than maybe like for personal reasons, right? If you're if you're shipping off to the Peace Corps next month, maybe you shouldn't buy a home right now, right? Um, And and I know some real estate investors would be like, you should buy a home whenever you can afford it. But but most people, you know, that that's a bad idea if there's a if there's a reason, a timing reason, or maybe you're right in the middle of going through a divorce or something very chaotic. Renting makes sense, but it should be a temporary solution. And, and I think of rates like gasoline, where if gasoline's $4 a gallon, I'm going to fill up my car with gas. If it's $3 a gallon, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to be glad it's only $3. If it goes down to $2 a gallon, I'm going to go, great, it's only $2 a gallon. That's amazing. But if it goes up to five or six, what am I going to do? I'm not going to love it, but I'm going to fill my car with gasoline because it's so much more valuable than, than not having fuel in my car. And interest rates are kind of the same way. If we can avoid sending all that money to the landlord and send it to the send it to the lender instead, then we're building the equity. Yes, the, the cash flow difference might be a little more to own a home than to rent in most scenarios, but there's but it's a flatter line. The cost of owning a home is significantly flatter over time, whereas the cost of renting just increases. And what a lot of people don't understand is that you're really not avoiding higher interest rates by renting. Because you're you're going to pay it indirectly, so higher interest rates and rent and and higher than normal rent increases are very highly correlated. Mm-hmm. So you've noticed in the same time when we've seen rates go up and values go up, what else has gone up? Rent, right? You're not avoiding that by by not buying. You're just paying for it indirectly. So if you can if you can lock in that that uh, that cost of living, you have to lock it in a little higher than what it is today. If you don't get roommates, right, that's another option, but it, it flattens that line over time. And if there's an opportunity to refinance, which I'm pretty confident in saying there will be sometime in the next 30 years, but I don't know if it'll be one or six months or five years. I don't know. I don't want to rely on that to for that to work, but eventually you own a home and I'm sure this has happened to you. You own a home that was, you could have rented for, well, well, let's let's avoid the numbers. Let's say you, you buy a home and it costs you a little more to to own it than rent it. But within a couple of years, you look around the neighborhood and you're like, holy cow, that that house is renting for more than my mortgage payment. I remember buying this house and remembering that was a sacrifice. Well, let's um maybe we could pull up a, a chart. Um, sure. You know, I you think. Want to use yours, it, or do you want me to bring? Uh, up money? Let's use yours from from the slides. Okay. Um, it was a chart on if you were to rent today. 
and yeah. what the cost of renting is going to be um, in 35 years. We could even use the grocery example, which I thought you started with the grocery example and sure. I thought it was like a this. great way to think about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but, but like Brady said, I mean, the cost of renting is just going to continue going up. Um, you know, what was a $900 rental 20 years ago is now a $3,000 or 30 years ago is now a $3,000 rental today. And what's a $3,000 rental today is going to be a $9,000 rental in 30 years. So, you know, it's not a, a perfect straight line like we show here, but that's the general trajectory. Rent is going to continue to go up. Great point, Sarah. Like all the things that you say are correct. And what's really hard for people, me included and you included, is to is to have the correct emotions about this, right? Our intuitions want to move things in straight lines, right? If something costs, you know, a dollar today and it costs two dollars tomorrow, it should cost three dollars the next day. But but inflation and compounding don't work that way. If I if something costs a dollar today and it costs two dollars a year from now, that's double. And the way inflation works, because it's compounding, it will double again given that same time frame. So if we look at what it costs to rent a home in 2023, and this is just an average in the metro area, I mean it, it doesn't matter exactly what numbers we use, but if it if rent increases by three and a half percent, which is less than than normal, by the way, so I'm using conservative numbers. If rent increases from three thousand dollars a month at 3.5%, then 35 years later, rent is going to be $9,703 a month. Which is like so hard to fathom. It's so hard to fathom. Yeah, because 10,000 bucks is a lot of money. It's a lot but of in, money. Yeah, and, and what'll happen in 2058, so again, I'm assuming that it's 3.5%. It could be more than that, it could be less, but even if it's, here's a couple of numbers, if it's 4.5% instead of 3.5%, it's going to cost $13,000 a month to rent. If, and it's if it's three, soon, it's 8,260. So these yeah. are, these are no matter what inflation number you use, they're big numbers. Big numbers, so yeah. The, the point isn't that it's going to be three and a half percent. We don't know that. I mean, that's a pretty consistent number for inflation, but it's actually below average for renting. But the idea is that in 2058, $9,703 a month for rent will feel normal to people at that time because it creeps up slowly. And remember in the, you know, I don't know, I've been in Colorado now for about 20 years. And I remember driving around and think, and seeing rent uh, houses for rent that were like, you know, $1,800 a month, $1,900 a month. And I was thinking, man, that's a lot. And, but that's never going to go above 2000 who it, that's never going to go above 2000. If it did, if somebody could really afford $2,100 a month in rent, they would just buy something instead. Right. So rents are, there's going to be some sort of glass ceiling. People aren't, aren't going to pay $2,000 a month for rent. But did they? Yeah, right. Nobody, nobody hesitated. Rents just kept going up right past 2000, now right past 3000. Rents just do that and it's merciless on your finances if you keep renewing the lease and keep going forward and not getting all the benefits of home ownership. It's just relentless. I actually remember when my husband and I moved from California, uh, we had been renting there and um, the place that we were renting was $2,500. And when we moved, um, the landlord put it on the market for 3,100 and it rented almost immediately. $600 increase. And yeah. that's inflation for you right there. You know, it's, that's just what's going to happen. So here's a similar chart that shows the cost of the cost of rent. These are the same numbers we saw earlier. Starts about 3,000, jumps up to 9,700. Here's the cost of home ownership. So if it costs about $4,000 a month to buy a similar home, this this bump here is because there's mortgage insurance. I'm assuming a 5% down scenario. You can do less than that. People put 3% down or you could do more. People put 10, 15, 20. People put all sorts of things down. If you're a veteran, you don't have to put any down. By the way, VA loans are really great for that. But this is, uh, this is when mortgage insurance disappears. But this is the cost over time, each the monthly cost over time of owning a similar property. And then when that house gets paid off, it's significantly less expensive to live there, right? In 30 years, instead of paying $8,000 a month in rent, you're paying $1,200 a month in tax insurance and maintenance on the home. I'm including that in the cost of ownership. So this is, and sometimes people will think, well, I'm not going to live in this house for 30 years. And I agree. Most people don't do that. However, when you, you have to get on the track at the beginning, but once you're on, you can use the equity in your, in the home that you're leaving to buy the next one, assuming you don't keep it as an investment, which is another strategy altogether. But once you're once you're on the home ownership track, 
you can transfer this, this shape, we'll call it in the graph, to the next place that you live. And you can either use it to upgrade or relocate or something like that, but you're building up, you're locking in one of the most expensive things that we pay for, which is shelter. You're locking in the cost of shelter to something that isn't, isn't um, affected by inflation nearly as much, right? Taxes and insurance, those do creep up over time, but your mortgage is a fixed payment. That's why this, that's why this total cost of home ownership is significantly lower. And, and to kind of expand on that a little bit further, um, you know, I think for people who are renting right now, there's two concepts um, in here. And what, what Brady was just showing is really the cash flow aspect of it, right? So at the beginning, it is going to cost more on a pure cash flow basis. So what you're spending on a monthly basis, it's going to cost more to own than it is to rent. Um, over time, that rent price is going to go up and there's going to be an inflection point where suddenly it becomes more expensive to rent than it does to own. And what when that inflection point is, whether it's five years or seven years or 10 years, that's going to be dependent upon rates. It's dependent upon how much money you put down as a down payment. Um, but for somebody who's just coming in and just wants to put 3% down or 5% down or your VA loan is 0% down, you know, that timeline is going to be a little bit further out, but there is an inflection point. It suddenly becomes from a cash flow basis more expensive to rent than to own. But there's another aspect of it, which is wealth accumulation. And this is what I think is so compelling, um, which is from day one, even if you are spending more on a cash flow basis to, to own than to rent, you are still net positive in terms of wealth accumulation. So all, all we've been talking about so far, right, is um, the cash flow. But there's also this right. equity component. And some people will say, well, yeah, but what if the market turns or something like that? If you're if you're planning on buying and selling the house a year from now, you are taking some meaningful risk, right? I don't know what prices on homes will be a year from now, but if you're planning on holding it for five years, eight years, 10 years, or if you're planning to live in the home or uh, you don't even have to live there. If you're planning to be in the real estate space, time is your friend. Like real estate has never been, never been, uh, never been as volatile as the stock market. And so if rates, you know, if, if values fall a little bit in the next year or two, but you're there for five or six, that isn't going to matter to you. Right. This is actually a, a graph of um, three bedroom townhomes and multifamily homes in the Denver metro area. I also have a, a chart of single family homes starts in January of 2009 to, through to today. And you know, this is exactly what, what Brady was saying. I mean, yes, there are dips, but it is going up, up, up. And the average annual growth rate is 9.7% per year in home price value for a three-bedroom three, you know, three townhome. Um, I can show you, hold on one second. This is, can you see it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Single family home, Denver metro area, three bed, two bath, single family home. Again, in 2009, that home was $144,500. And today it's $502,250. Annual growth rate of 8.8%. Um, I just think that that's a, a really compelling number. And keeping these numbers in mind, average growth of 8.8%. You know, Brady, we can pull up your your model now where I think you're assuming a five percent annual growth rate. Four and a half, right? actually. Four and yeah. a half percent annual growth rate. And and we can look at the numbers that Brady's showing, but this in real life is actually a higher growth rate, which you know just further accentuates this wealth factor that we're going to talk about. So this is the equity that you build up over time. So again, this I was assuming a $25,000 down payment, which is 5% on a $500,000 home. So some of this equity that you have was, was already your money from before. But by the end of year one, using 4.5% appreciation between the debt pay down, because every time you make a mortgage payment, you're also paying off debt instead of giving it all to the landlord. So between the debt pay down and the appreciation on the home, after a year, you have 51000 or almost $52,000 of equity, assuming it appreciates at 4.5%, which, as you showed, was just pretty low. And, and in your initial investment, right? So it's initial investment plus debt pay down plus home price 
home value yep. appreciation. And these figures here are the difference in cash flow each month between this between renting and owning. So these I brought over some numbers from that previous previous graph where we saw those things cross over. So yeah, it might cost almost a thousand dollars or more, a thousand dollars or so to own that home instead of rent, assuming that you don't have a, a roommate or something, or if you're, they call that house hacking, where you you buy a home and you rent a room out to help with the, the cash flow um, uh, of owning. But within 10 years, you're spending less money to live there than you would be if you were renting and you have $360,000 of equity. That's not think, nothing, right? That's decent. Yeah, I think a kind of cool way to think about this too is, is, is somebody could say to you, Okay, you give me a thousand dollars a month, right? So a thousand dollars extra out of your pocket. But at the end of the year, I'm going to give you fifty two thousand dollars, and that's really it's a pretty good savings rate. What you're at, right? So yeah, you're spending more, but at the end of the even just that one period, all of a sudden you are fifty two thousand dollars wealthier than you were a year ago, and after yeah. five years, you're one hundred and seventy four thousand dollars wealthier. I mean, that is like to me, mind blowing. It's, it's really exciting actually, just to think about being in a position to have that kind of wealth and equity. Um, it's, it's just so then, compelling. Yeah. And the, the sad, maybe it's not sad. It's just reality. The truth is you have to do most of us anyway, have to pick one or one or the other track, right? We got to pay a landlord or we got to pay a lender unless, unless we've paid the house off. Right. But we have to spend money to live somewhere and you're either giving it to the landlord and they're taking advantage of all these things because they own the property. They're getting the equity. They're getting this positive cash flow, or you can do this for yourself. Right. So I like to, I like to show where the money goes in this format. So let's imagine that that's your wealth. It doesn't matter how much it is. Could be a thousand, could be a million, but when you pay rent in this example, you're paying rent and some insurance for like renter's insurance that just gets deducted out of your wealth. Now, granted, your wealth is going up every time you get a paycheck. But if we just look at it on the day that you make that that rent payment it costs you three thousand thirteen dollars in that month between rent and insurance. You don't get any appreciation. So that cost your wealth was was diminished by three thousand thirteen dollars. Now, if we look at the same thing on a mortgage payment, and the reason I specify the first mortgage payment is because the first one is the worst one. Because it has, so mortgage payments are fixed payments, but there's more, more of it's attributed to interest in the earlier years because you have a larger outstanding balance. And then it shifts over time so that toward the end of a mortgage, much more of your payment is going toward principal than it was in the beginning, which is a good thing. Uh, so what I'm, what I'm getting at is I'm going to analyze the very worst mortgage payment, the one that has the most interest in it before you've paid down any of the mortgage. Now there's tax and there's insurance. There's interest and mortgage insurance. If you don't put 20% down uh, with most loans, you have to you, you have to have mortgage insurance. There's some exceptions to that, but those exceptions have higher interest rates. Uh, so you pay the, the interest and the mortgage insurance. Then there's principal. That, that's a part of the mortgage payment as well. But that principal doesn't change your wealth. So even though you have to pay it, the amount that is that is principal in your mortgage payment, it uh, it pays down debt by that exact amount because it's principal. So you're, like you're going into a savings a lot, account. Yeah, you're buying equity with that exact dollar amount because you've removed some of the debt on the property. So while your payment is thirty eight oh two, so it is higher cash flow than that three thousand thirteen dollars a month. The cost to your wealth is only thirty four forty nine because this part doesn't change your wealth. This is going to principal. It's paying down a liability. And if the house appreciates by four and a half percent, then that what. 1875 is one twelfth of four and a half percent on that property. So this is just a monthly, a monthly appreciation. Now I know that that homes don't appreciate if they appreciate by four and a half percent in a year, that doesn't mean they appreciate by one twelfth of four and a half percent every month. But if we're looking at this over a long period of time, we can attribute appreciation down to the monthly level. So if you get if you're if you're getting four and a half percent appreciation each year, then every month you're getting about 1875 in wealth. That goes back into your pocket as money and wealth that belongs to you. So the, the net effect on your wealth in the very first payment of owning the home is only $1,574. So when you compare that to what it costs to rent, you're $1,438 ahead on the very worst mortgage payment. And that's happening every month. That's eighteen almost $18,000 a year. 
that's a lot of that's a lot of money going to the landlord instead of yourself. And it just gets worse because when you're on the renting, you know, rent just relentlessly increases and increases and increases. I'd so. love to pull up the the chart that you, we have of um, the wealth, the yeah. wealth, wealth differential um, over time. I think that's also really compelling because I think when you look at it on a month by month basis or even on a year by year basis, again, sometimes people just kind of like can't get their head around it. But when I, when you look at it over 35 years to see how much money you have paid in rent versus, and, and, and with nothing to show for it, right. You're paying that rent and you don't own anything. You just, just money out the door versus at the end of that 30 or 35 year period, um, you know, seeing where you're at from a wealth perspective, from owning, there's such a large differential. It's, it's just very compelling. Yeah. So what I'll do before I do that is I'll look at five years later. So I'm going to look at the 61st rent payment. So imagine you've rented for five more years. The landlord shows up with a new, a new lease agreement and you just sign it rather than, rather than, uh, rather than going and buying a home. So by then your rent has now crept up. I'm using three and a half percent increase on rent. Your rent and insurance is now 3,700 bucks. It happened slowly because that happened over five years, but it creeps up. So that that's now costing your wealth. $3,700. $3,700. Now, this is important because it's happening. Compounding equations are very powerful and, and they're not intuitive. So we have to do the calculations and interpret them into real life experiences. But in in renting is a compounding equation that is going down, right? It's, it's taking more and more money from you that could be going into your pocket each and every month. And it, and it gets worse and worse and worse every month. So it creates this compounding equation that is that is below zero. It's costing you more and more money. Whereas home ownership is a compounding equation that goes the other way. And so now what we're looking at is the difference between the two tracks of home ownership and renting are, are two compounding equations that are moving away from each other. And so that the effect is two compounding equations instead of just one. One enough is, or one alone is powerful enough, but two is, is even worse. So in the fifth year, it's costing you $3,700 every month, which is like $43,000, I think, something like that every year. That's crazy. Now here's, now we're in the mortgage payment. Now we have more of it going to principal. So that's a bigger number, which is good because that's the money that pays off the debt. There's no more PMI. So we don't have to pay that anymore. There is still some interest and it's not a small amount. So your payment is 3717. The cost to your wealth is only 3205 because this part just doesn't affect your wealth. But now appreciation is also a compounding thing. So we're not appreciating by 1875 a month anymore. It's now 2300 because it's a larger asset appreciating. Mm-hmm. So now it's costing our wealth even less to own five years later than it did in the beginning, because we're getting more of that offset by the appreciation on the property. And the cost when we rent is getting worse and worse at an increasing rate. So by year five, you're making progress on, on this higher track of home ownership versus the, the financial track of renting to the tune of $2,800 a, a month. And it just keeps getting it. And the longer you go, the worse and worse it gets. So if we, so within five years, these, these two paths have diverged to the tune of about a hundred thousand dollars. So this has cost my wealth to, to rent $194,000. Whereas it's only cost me $91,000 in my wealth to put a roof over my head if I own the home. So I know a lot of people will want to see this be positive, And it is because you have to pick one of these tracks, right? Buying a home costs money. Putting a roof over your head costs money. And it takes a while for the appreciation on that property to start to overtake all the expenses to live there. So by the time, you know, 30 years down the road, you've spent a lot of money to own this home. You've spent probably, oh, probably a million bucks, but you have a million four hundred thousand in equity. So you're net ahead of all the money you've spent. You're ahead by 400 grand, whereas you've spent $2 million in rent over that period of time and you have nothing to show for it. It adds up so quickly. That's such an important point, right? You don't buy and you have zero expenses. I mean, you are going to have expenses and, and certainly in the near term, um, as you, as it shows here, you know, you're, you're going to be negative, but you are going to hit a point where the home value appreciation is going to overtake what your, what your expenses have been. And suddenly you're accumulating wealth in in a really meaningful way. Right. And the whole point isn't, isn't, um, it isn't, well, I'll I'll say what you said again in a little bit of a different way. 
where he said, yeah, it's going to cost something, but we're not comparing it to nothing, right? You have to compare it against your other option. If your other mm -hmm. option is renting, this is the difference. Like you're going to be spending the money anyway. So you may as well be getting the financial benefit for doing so. Because these differences just, they get massive. Would like you rather spend $91,000 or $194,000? Would you rather spend $135,000 or $424,000? Exactly. And it, it's because you're, you own what you're paying for when you own the home. And a lot of times, so I'll, I'll point this out too. And this is, sometimes I come across this. I'm sure you've come across this as well as a, as a realtor, but sometimes people, people are a little bit intimidated about owning a home. And the bottom line is owning a home and renting a home is a pretty similar life, right? There's a month, especially, especially in the early years when it's a pretty big portion of your expenses, it becomes less and less as you own because it's a fixed cost while everything else is, is costing more and you're making more hopefully in your career. But the, the, uh, the, the day-to-day -day life is pretty similar. You write a check, you live there for 30 days. You write a check, you live there for 30 days, right? It's a very similar process. Now, every once in a while, there's going to be, you know, um, you know, water gets into the, into the carpet or something. You got to pull it up and dry it out or call somebody to do that. But for $1,500 a month, you know, difference, that's how, that's how quickly these are diverging in the beginning. Because that remember how the difference in the first month's mortgage payment, you can afford a lot of a lot of those things way more than you'll really need uh, with that kind of wealth disparity, right? So one month out of twelve, you got to call a plumber maybe, or what you really do is just call Sarah because she's gonna. Realtors are great at having. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, you've got this problem. I know who to call. This person's yeah. reliable. I'll have that them. is very true. Here's their number, right? So you really it owning a home is not complicated. It's very much like renting on a day-to-day -day basis, but now you're in charge, which is good and bad, right? It's your responsibility, but you get, you get the equity to show for it. And you, you get your, your expenses, uh, significantly more flat. So, I mean, just the difference between in 30 years, the difference between the rent track and the own track is about $2.3 million. And this is on a $500,000 $500, house, $500,000 home, right? So, yeah. um, if you buy a $500,000 home and then, you know, you upgrade to a $700,000 home or a million dollar home, this becomes even more pronounced. Certainly. Uh, um, here, let me stop sharing. Yeah. So it's a big deal. That's why I'm here, right? I'm that the, my financial career was good to me. Um, I left and sold my practice because it was important to me to help people understand things from this perspective. Um, I just wanted to bring up one more point, which is sure. um, sort of the the cost benefit analysis or or the the co I guess other costs associated with buying, right? Like I think if you want to become a homeowner, a first time homeowner. Um, Sometimes to make that happen, there has you have to give up other things. So for example, maybe you live by yourself, you want to buy a home, maybe you get a roommate, right? To help cover the costs. Or um, you have to create a food budget and you can't eat out five nights a week. You only eat out once a week or twice a week or something like that. You know, there's <clears throat> there are oftentimes in order to make home ownership possible, there has to be, you know, a little bit of give and take in other areas of your life. But when you look at, just look at the numbers, um, it really makes it so worth it. Um, and that's, and and Brady and I talked about this a little bit earlier, um, just amongst ourselves, we hadn't, we hadn't videoed it, but, you know, sometimes a lot of times people come in and they have this vision of buying a home and they want the, you know, three, whatever, three bed, four bed, two bath, three bath. They want a yard. They want to live in like the prime area of town and you know they just have this vision of the perfect home but the reality is is um particularly when you are a first time home buyer a lot of times you can't have it all and so the first thing you need to do is is just get in there and, and buy a home that you can afford that and and maybe that means you don't live in the prime area of town maybe that means that you have one less bedroom or you don't have the yard that you want but you get in there and you start accumulating wealth and then you accumulate wealth to be able to buy the the home that you want and the home that you love. Yeah, like who do you, who is going to be more likely to buy the dream home? Somebody who has been owning a home for three or four years and they're three hundred thousand dollars more wealthy, 
or someone who's been giving all that money away to the landlord and trying to scrounge up, you know, a hundred thousand dollars to put down on a property and they have no equity to help them with that. Right. The best way to get, I want you to have the property of your dreams. You do too, Sarah, like whoever's watching you, I want you to have the property of your dreams. The best way to get it is to buy what you can afford now and use the financial benefit to, to get the house that you want later. If you can't afford that house you want later now, then that's not an option on the table anyway, right now. The best way to make that an option is to build some equity and start putting that in your back pocket rather than the landlords. And rather than, and and think about it this way too. Like, let's say you you say, oh, I just need to save. And so you're paying rent and paying rent and you're putting money aside every month to save. Well, why not take that money that you're putting aside, buy a house and you're still putting that money aside and it's growing at a really good rate with home value appreciation. Um and and you're just appreciating that value and, and gaining wealth in, in a more, um, I don't know what the word is, but like a more rapid way than if you're just paying rent and it's going nowhere for you and the money's just sitting there. <laughs> yeah, because you're, you're, you're paying the bill anyway. It's not exactly the same amount, but you're making, you're, you're spending money to live indoors. So you've got to spend it anyways. You can't opt out of this game. Most of us anyway. Maybe maybe people are still living with mom and dad or something. That might be a little different. But for most of us, we can't opt out of this game. You got you to write a check to live indoors one way or the other. So you may as well get all that financial benefit. And if you like eating out, by the way, if you want to go do all those things and, and indulge a little bit, you know, I think of, you know, like check who's the... Who's more likely to eat out more? The person who's spending this to live in their home or the person who keeps spending this? right? It only matters for a short period of time. I had a friend point out, you know, this is the delayed gratification right here. This is the reward for, so for of these 35 years in this model, assuming there's no opportunities to refinance, which I, I, I would imagine there would be, but I don't like to, I don't like to need that in order for this to work. But if you're not able to refinance, yeah, for the first eight years, it costs a little more to live there, you know, to, to own than to rent. But for the next 20, well, the rest of your life, for the rest of your life, it costs significantly less. So if eating out is your thing, you got a lot more of a of disposable income to do that once it's once you're not spending, you know, seven thousand dollars a month from rent 20 years from now or 25 years from now, right? That difference is your is money in your pocket. And as Brady said, I mean, we don't know what's gonna happen with interest rates. Um People thought they would come down this year and they're still getting higher. So, you know, you just you really don't know what's gonna happen. Um, rates do tend to move in three to five year cycles. What that looks like, we don't know. Um, but as he said, at some point, at some point they'll come down. And, and, and the other thing, I guess, one other thing I'll, I'll say is, um, there are opportunities for lower rates today in a number of different ways. Um, your lender can talk to you about permanent as well as um, temporary interest rate buy downs. In today's buying environment, a lot of times sellers will actually pay to have your interest rate bought down. Um, with a temporary buy down, for example, if today's interest rate's at 8% and you do a 2 1 buy down, that means in year one you're paying 6%. In year two, you're paying 7% and then you start paying 8%. So it gives you a little bit of temporary. And we're seeing a lot of that. Yeah, a lot of that temporary relief on your on your interest payments. There's also three to one buy downs, which goes even a year further and, and one interest rate um, percentage point lower. Um, there's also- well, I want to make downs. a quick point on that, Sarah, if you don't mind. Yeah. People sometimes will think, yeah, if I get a three to one buy down. So if, I, if a normal rate would be eight, for example, and it buys it down to five the first year and then six the next year and then seven the next year, and then it then it sits at eight and and stays there forever. Well, and, unless you refinance, right? People will sometimes think, well, yeah, but if I start at five, then the next year it'll be six, six, and my expenses will go up. And it's like, yeah, but that's going to happen if you rent too, right? Of course they're going to go up. That's a, that's how the buy downs work, the temporary ones. You can also have rates purchased or bought down permanently, but but regardless, like you can't be thinking of it like, well, yeah, but if it's five now, it'll be six next year. Yeah, your rent is going to go up too. So and now we're at least getting all the benefits of of putting that equity in our pocket and owning what we're paying for. Mm -hmm. Um, so so there are you know opportunities from that perspective, and then um, a lot of the builders they have in house lenders, um, 
and they offer monthly promotions on, on things, um, you know, in like the fours and fives. And so if you're willing to consider a newly built home and that sounds like a, an opportunity that, that you'd like to pursue, there also is an option there to get, uh, get lower rates, but um, <clears throat> talk to your lender. Rady works for American Liberty Mortgage. They have some amazing lenders. Um, all you have to do is have a conversation with them. Um, you can have a very high level conversation where they don't pull your credit, but you can just sort of talk about what your income is and what your credit score is. And they can give you just a ballpark idea, nothing definitive of, of what your interest rate might look like. And they can give you options about um, you know things that you might want to look out for. But this is, is actually a really good time to be negotiating um, on the purchase of properties, to be negotiating with sellers, to have them actually help you lower your interest rate. So um, yeah, you a don't year have ago, to pay 8%. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. Like a year ago, a lot of people were thinking, well, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait till people stop bidding $100,000 over asking, then I'm going to buy a home. Like I, I can't go out there and buy a home if there's 40 offers on it. And the, the offer that's, that wins is $100,000 over asking. So a lot of tenants or a lot of renters were thinking, I can't go out into this market and and do that. I can't afford that. I'm going to wait for that to end. But guess what? That ended. What caused that to end were the interest rates and in, interest rate increase. So so it's like a, it's a teeter-totter. One of those if interest rates were to drop today, it would flood the market with buyers and then we'd go back into a position where sellers don't have to give any concessions. In fact, they people are overbidding on the property because they want it if rates are that cheap. So we're in a position now where you can get sellers to pay for the rate buy down. You can get sellers to concede some things. And then if rates go back down and values pop up and the market rushes with buyers again, you'll already have the property. And then you can refinance into that lower rate. So you'll get the lower rate eventually when it drops anyway. And you'll get the, the benefit of the appreciation that that will cause. That's exactly right. Yeah. I mean, I, I have heard time and time again, people just saying they wanted to wait for rates to drop. And, you know, as, as Brady mentioned at the beginning of this, you know, people always think that real estate agents come up, you know, when's a good time to buy is the market right. And it's like, the, you can always come up with a reason why the market's right, but it is true. You know, there's the opportunity as a buyer to be able to negotiate for a lower interest rate and seller concessions and, and, and get in and negotiate on price um, to buy a property right now is very, very high. And when rates begin to drop, the market is going to be flooded and people are going to be bidding over asking and it's going to become a lot harder to, to buy again. And, and that's really the reality of the situation. So yes, rates are higher now, but take advantage of that, get in and then, and then, and then enjoy that home value appreciation when, when people are start overbidding for things. Yeah. So anyway, well, Brady, thank you so much. This was an My awesome pleasure. conversation. Um, for those of you guys watching, Brady and I are going to be doing, uh, um, more of these, not just covering renting. We're going to talk about, um, a bunch of other topics related to real estate and we're, he and I both like to dig into the numbers on things and, and do some analytics. So, um, it'll be really exciting to see what we have coming up in terms of other conversations. So thank you so much. Thanks, Sarah. Have a good day. Mm -hmm.